Welcome to FinCap's Driving Ambition web series and podcast. I'm Rajan Datta. Over the next few weeks, I'll be touring the country in an all-electric black cab, visiting an array of leading UK PLC small and medium-sized enterprises, all selected from FinCap's Ambition Nation listed 50. I'll be speaking to CEOs and business leaders to find out what are the key factors that drove their success. What was their company's unique journey? Because this is Ambition Nation. You come from a very, very different kind of background to, to most business leaders, I suspect. Tell me about that. Tell me about how it started and what happened. I think that's a bit of an understatement. <laughs> I actually started off my working life as a Glasgow policewoman at WPC 247. And that was the days before equal pay. And I was there before equal pay, I was there during the transition to equal pay, and I was there for the aftermath afterwards. Now, the men didn't think that we, the women were up to it and we weren't as capable as them, so forth and so on. So we were given the roughest, toughest patrols in the city. Now, I personally was given the, uh, the city mortuary, the fish market and the river. And on the night shift, I used to go down to the city mortuary because Glasgow was a dangerous place in those days in the 70s. And Jimmy, the mortuary attendant, he became my new best friend. And when I went in on the night shift, Jimmy would say, let's play a wee game while the kettle was boiling. And he'd take me into a room, and the game we played was called Spot the Organ. And what happened there was <laughs> Jimmy would pour the organs onto a table from a post-mortem that had been performed that day, and I had to guess what they were. If I got any of them wrong, he went into a huff and I never got a cup of tea. And so that was my early experience of the police force, or certainly one of them. I have lots and lots of funny stories you from those squeamish, days. You weren't squeamish then, presumably. I was probably too young, naive and ignorant <laughs> to be squeamish. But anyway, after four years of playing spot the organ with Jimmy, off I went to the Middle East. I thought it was time for pastures new and I joined an Arab airline. I was based in the Middle East and I stayed there for 12 years. Now, if I thought there was discrimination and inequality in the Glasgow police force, it was nothing to what a young woman aged 21 would experience in the Middle East in those times. But I left in uh, when the Gulf War started, and by that stage I had two young children. I returned to the UK, and I thought I was the best thing uh, to be introduced to the workplace. And so I thought I'd get a job as a senior HR manager or something. But in fact, the best job I could get was a waitress. It was as though I had useless mother stamped on my forehead, and nobody wanted to employ me. Now, that was not a very uh, pleasant or positive experience. And I certainly don't want any of my daughters or any young women for that fact um, having to experience what I experienced back then. And that certainly influenced the way I think now and my passion for uh, equality and diversity. How much do you feel that you should play a role as a mentor, as a role model to young women, particularly in this kind of industry, which is very male-dominated? It, it abs absolutely is male-dominated, in fact. Um, within the technology industry, I think there's 17% female representation, which is pretty poor. Now, in our organization, FDM, we have, in fact, 30% of our workforce are female, which we're very proud of. I wish mentoring had been around when I was a young woman. Unfortunately, it wasn't, but it certainly is nowadays. And at FDM, we have a formal mentoring uh, structure. Do you think there is a business argument as to why there should be more women working um, in, this, in this industry, in fact, across the board? Well, there is a skill shortage, that's point number one. In fact, there's a skill shortage worldwide in technology. All companies are now fishing in the same pond, they all want the same talent, and there isn't enough talent to go around. And the skills gap is getting bigger, not smaller. So we need everybody we can in tech. Um, and the, the gender question is out there. Um, there's lots of initiatives. We at FTM, we have our returners program. It's called Getting Back to Business, where we've actually, over the last couple of years, brought in 125 women uh, returners into the organization. Uh, we have a, a women in tech initiative. It is so important to get more females into tech because they are 50% of the population. And in fact, a, a recent government statistic uh, read that if we improve our female participation within STEM, we can increase 
the, um, the economy by 2%, that's 55 billion pounds by 2020, uh, 2030, and that's significant. The other aspect is, is that from that very different kind of background, how has that informed the decisions you make as a leader? How does that you know, um, affect what you do from day to day in this job? It's interesting because I suppose I, I haven't ever been very traditional, have I? Um, what we say at FDM is we don't care where you've come from. We're only interested in your potential and what you want to achieve. And that plays out really well because uh, in our organisation, we have 44% uh, of our workforce are the first person in their family to go to university. We have uh, 75 different nationalities and uh, ethnic backgrounds. We have, um, as I mentioned earlier, a high proportion of women. We measure, um, we measure so many diversity stats, and that is really important to us. So as a leader, what we say is that everyone's welcome and there's a home for everyone at FDM. I think organisations who only recruit from top Ivy League universities, they're missing a trick. And in terms of the style of leadership, just give me a flavour of, of how you approach it. When you've been in business as long as, as, long as I have, you get, you get to understand the trends and head them off at the past, perhaps. Uh, a lot of our decision making, a lot of my own decision making is data driven, uh, evidential based. But there's a lot that is uh, by intuition and just by experience. And sometimes we just need to take a risk take a risk of winning. Now, we don't always win, but we don't always fail. But you started, I mean, the zero to hero thing. I mean, just I mean, tell me about that, that trajectory, that, that journey. What, how, you know, how did that go? My husband, uh, Rod Flavel, he started FDM in uh, 1991, I think it was. And it was the usual attic startup with £60,000 seed capital. It was £20,000 from three different individuals. Very quickly, the money was burned and we were on the verge of going bust. Rod had to get in the car to drive to Birmingham to pick up a cheque. Had he not come back with the cheque, then we wouldn't be sitting here today. But he did, he came home with the bacon and you and I are having a chat and FDM now has a market cap of circa one billion pounds. Now I'm interested in, in the company's um, kind of trajectory when it comes to listing, because, because you were private, then you listed, then you went private again and now you're um, listed again. So tell me about that, that journey. How come all, all that happened? When we were on the A market, the share price didn't really move because there was a lack of liquidity. Um, because there was a lack of liquidity, um, we just stagnated for five years. Every year, year on year, we made a profit. Every year we had a record year and the share price didn't move and that was really frustrating. The staff during that period and the management they didn't really have much skin in the game, so there wasn't much to motivate us. So all in all, for the five years we were on AIM, uh, share price didn't rise, but the profitability of the organisation did. Uh, the shareholders were getting brilliant dividends, but the staff weren't really uh, being rewarded in the same way. And something had to change. So in 2009, we made a decision to buy the company back with the, with the help of private equity. So we initiated a buyback off market. And that was quite challenging because uh, we did have to stick our heads above the parapet. However, we managed to um, complete the transaction. We were the last deal on the stock market in 2009. And uh, the private equity years were certainly golden years for FDM and the management team. We brought share ownership back into the management and staff hands. And you, now, now you are listed on the main stock exchange. How, how do you do? You think it's, it's working well for you? Now that we are back on the main market, I have to say yes, it's working well for us because we've been promoted to be a FTSE 250 company. The share price has uh, has improved from when we listed. We um, we were over, oversubscribed at the listing, which was also a good sign. And in fact. A lot of the investors who invested in us first time round came back and reinvested. So that kind of demonstrates belief in FDM. There's something that we always like to ask, which is, which is in terms of look past, uh, look at your whole career, your whole life, not just your career. But is, is there one decision that you made 
during that time that you think was key, was significant, was a game changer? Yes. To buy the company back off market was absolutely a game changer. Because when we bought the company off market with the help of private equity, at that point, we invited all staff to contribute into the new company. And we had a formula of, um, because there was a, an amount of sweet equity that was available um, for the management team. And we didn't want to keep that just for the management team. It was for anybody who, who felt committed enough to want to invest. Um, and those who invested ended up getting uh, loan notes with 13% interest. And at the end of, I think it was 18 months, we paid back the loan notes, but they still kept the sweet equity. And then we were paying, uh, did we, I think we paid dividends on that as well. And that created a whole new tranche of owners. It was just transformational. Now, after four years of being a private company, when we listed, uh, we made 16 times money for the investors. And I believe that was the biggest and uh, the most profitable investment that the private equity house had ever made to that point. So it wasn't just the private equity company who did well, it was all of those staff members who believed in the company. Plus, in a sense, you were leading by example, weren't you? You were putting your money where your mouth was by doing that. We were putting hard-earned cash. In fact, um, the first tranche of shares that I purchased, FDM shares, I remortgaged my house in order to buy them, I remember. And I thought, my God, what am I doing? Because I bought shares in what was a private company. That was way before the AIM days. And I thought, I might never see this money again. But, you know, it was the the best remortgage I ever did. And uh, because of that, I didn't have to remortgage again. And nor did a lot of other staff, which is wonderful, isn't it? Fantastic. And obviously, a business like yours relies on innovation, R&D. How do you keep that bubbling away? How do you, how do you make sure that, that that's strong enough to be ahead of your rivals, for start off? It's innovate or die. And we firmly believe that. We take our lead from our clients. We're out there with the radar and whatever clients are moving to, we've got to very quickly get on board and move with them. And that's what's helped us not just survive, but thrive over the last 28 years. So a lot of our clients are in FinTech and we find out what the technologies are that they're moving towards. And once we know what they're moving towards, we have to move likewise so that we can serve them. What makes FDM distinct and, and unique, do you think, compared to anybody else, really, any other companies? I don't know that FDM is unique, although some um, clients think that our um, product offering, our service offering, is fairly unique. Um, there, there is a, a bit of competition out there that's uh, been developing over recent years, but back in the day, there wasn't really anyone else who was offering the sort of hybrid service that FDM offers. And we'll expand on that for me. I mean, is that, is that something that you realised, we, we've got something here, we've got, a, we've got a market that's ready for what we can provide? I mean, how, many, how did you get to that point where you knew that you were onto something? Well, FGM has made a profit every year with the exception of 2002, that's post the dot-com bubble bursting. So I think we realised quite a long time ago that we were onto something because every year we were having a record year. And, um, you know, clearly with the skills shortage that we provide a service. Last year in the UK alone, um, I believe we recruited maybe uh, 1,200 or so people uh, into our em permanent employee base, and that was in the UK alone, probably 2,500 people worldwide. So with that amount of recruitment, there's clearly a demand and an increasing demand for FDM service. What key decision in your life do you think has been a game changer, has been absolutely significant in the way that things have turned out? Um, possibly our internationalisation programme. We have a number of FDM locations worldwide and that has really um, helped our business. We have um, uh, the, the North American fact is our second largest uh, area or, or entity. Uh, we have probably about a thousand people working for us, maybe more actually, working in North America. Um, we've recently moved to Australia and it's let us understand that there's space, there's room for FDM 
in all continents. We actually work in every continent. We're in Australia, yeah, Asia, North America, Africa. We're everywhere. <laughs> and is, is there any check to that growth? No, because there is a worldwide skills shortage, whether it be North America, Australia, Asia, China, we're in China. Um, there is a, it, a worldwide shortage. Incredible. Because yeah. every organization nowadays is a tech company. You know, back in the day, we used to work with utilities companies, uh, finance companies, and telecoms. But now every single organization is underpinned by technology. They cannot function without technology. So um, there's a huge and growing requirement for digital and tech services, even farming. Sheila, tell me about the culture of, of the workplace, the culture of the business that you, that you have. How important is that? At FDM, we have a distinct culture. It's a high energy, uh, work hard, play hard. It's a young culture because 90% of our staff are millennials, but we do have some, some older people um, like myself as well. Um, when we internationalize, the challenge is how do we export that culture to those international locations? Well, somehow we've managed to do it, and I think we've done that because we take people from the mothership who live and breathe the culture and they embed the culture into those new locations. I think that's probably how we've managed to achieve that. Let me just end with, with, with one more question, which is about the, 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 the role that you feel is important in terms of influencing women and, and persuading women to do well in this business. What, what are the tips that you, you would give to any young woman starting up, um, and perhaps wanting to, to emulate you and be at this position at you know, some point in their career? I'd say, don't go to the city mortuary and play spot the organ with Jimmy. <laughs> OK, <And> assuming, <laughs> assuming that they won't do that, yes. <laughs> but seriously, um, I have to think about my daughters, three young women um, starting out in, in technology. What, would, what advice would I give them? Well, I'd say find someone that you admire and ask them if they will mentor you. And uh, you don't need to have one mentor. You can have several mentors with different things. Um, look for a role model or various role models and try to decide what you identify in those role models. Um, say yes to everything, put your hand up to everything, be the first to volunteer, get your head down and enjoy your career because there's never been a better time for a woman to enter a career in technology. The opportunities are boundless.